Today, we're going to cover end-time prophets. And it's going to be quite interesting indeed. Now, we need to look at some other things first. The astronomers are always busy at the James Webb Space Telescope. And what they have done, they have snapped a photo of a huge world in a distant solar system. The Expo planet is located 12 light years away, trillions of miles, but right next door, cosmically speaking. The world is somewhat like a giant gas Jupiter, but twice as massive. So, they had to discover a lot of things out there, but they haven't discovered God yet. That's quite amazing. Now, they've also discovered this. Now, every jeweler in the world is going to want to get in on this. Mercury, now, I don't know how they discover these things, and I don't know how they actually can prove that it's so. But Mercury has a layer of diamond 10 miles thick. That's quite a thing. Now, here's another one. Religious liberty victory. In Virginia, the courts dealt blow to the school district's unconstitutional pronoun and bathroom policies. And look at the fewer that they have at the, the Olympics. Okay, so they found Wednesday that students can challenge unconstitutional transgender pronouns and bathroom policies. Well, that's what they want to do. Now, remember this. The closer and closer and closer and closer that any society gets to open worship of Satan the devil... It's nearer collapse. And tie that in with the report. I think we still have it online there by Unwin is his name. Now, he's not a religious figure, but he did a, a study on why sexual morality is the best. And what happens to a nation when they become very Sodom and Gomorrah-like, if I could add that to it, okay? And we're getting close to that. They are either taken over by invasion, or they collapse economically and then taken over. And all of that is the hand of God. Now, you look, as I have mentioned many times, all of these digs that they're doing in various places around the world— trying to find out, well, how did these people live? Uh, what was their religion like? And when you get down to all of the fine print, they were open Satan worshipers, sacrificing human beings, aborting babies. And so that's a message for us today here in America. Very interesting. Netanyahu went and spoke before the combined Senate and House of Representatives, and Kamala Harris was supposed to be there to start the proceedings. She never showed up. And she never went to a meeting with him. So it shows something very strange going on, and it looks like the Democrats are really struggling to find out what they're going to do. So we'll just have to wait and see. But the essence of his message was this, that they're not just coming after the Jews in Jerusalem. They're coming after Americans as well. So with the invasion of people coming into America and all the things that that represents— now, if anyone thinks that if Trump gets in, it's going to be smooth and lovely and nice, no, it's going to be upside down and backward 
trying to get rid of all of these illegal aliens. And they still do not understand. As we have learned from Deuteronomy 28, that the stranger within your gate shall rise up high above you, and you shall come down very low. That's in a process. And now it is taking a giant step forward with the 15 to 20 million illegals that cross the border. And it's another lesson also to understand that when the morals of the people get evil and they accept all kinds of perversion and they break the Sabbath and break the holy days and go after their own idols. See, now this is something to understand. Let's come back here to Ezekiel, the 14th chapter, and let's look at what is really important for us to understand, and why conversion is necessary, and what God looks to. God looks to more than just the outward obedience of what people do or don't do, whether they're nice or not nice, okay? Of course, he takes interest in in them who are committing all kinds of crimes, Ezekiel 14. Okay, here we go. Now, before we start reading, remember the comment as to why God brought the flood in the days of Noah, that the thought of everyone was only evil continuously. There was no way to stop it. And out of all the people, then there must have been a billion and a half or two billion people by that time. Noah was the only righteous man in his family to come through the flood. And it's very interesting that the man who lived the longest, Methuselah, died just before the flood came. Okay, So God is not looking to your outward things that you do. God is looking at what is in your mind. And so as we look at America and we look, why are we going down? Why are we going down? We can see the sins out there. We can see the problems in, in government. We can see the problems in education. We can see them in every facet of life that we have. And everybody's trying to correct this problem and correct that problem and correct the other problem. But here's what it is. Now, we read that last week about their their lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Now, let's expand on that here in Ezekiel 14. Now, they were in captivity. These were the ones out of the ten northern tribes who were taken captivity in the first invasion by the Assyrians and moved out of the land. And some of the elders of Israel came to me and sat before me, and the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, these men have set up idols in their hearts. Isn't it interesting? What did Jesus say? Where your treasure is, that's where your heart will be. And we have a new book that's at the printing press right now, The True Riches of God, which everyone on the mailing list will receive with a CD because it has it has uh, transcripts in it. And it will be very inspiring for you. See? So this tells us what? God is interested in what people think as well as what they do because before they do whatever they do, they think it. So he said, Son of man, these men have set up idols in their heart 
put a stumbling block of their iniquity before their faces, and should I at all be inquired by them? Now, let's remember something else that took place. Remember in the days of Josiah, he brought the people back to God to a certain degree, but he couldn't get rid of all of the all of the incense centers and false worshipers spread out through the land. When he died, then God said, I'm going to bring all of this upon Jerusalem because of the sins of Manasseh and the shedding of innocent blood. So, let's look and examine what are the idols that people have in their minds. Well, the biggest one is self. Lovers of self. And then everything else flows from that. So here's what God says. Therefore speak to them and say to them, thus says the Lord God, every man of the house of Israel who sets up idols in his heart. See, instead of worshiping God, loving God, keeping his commandments, they're going their own way. Again, God is judging the heart and mind, right? and put the stumbling block of his iniquity before his face, and comes to the prophet, I, the Lord, will answer him according to the multitude of his idols. That's why we have all the troubles that we do. That's an answer from God about the behavior of the people at every level in the society. Government all the way down to the homeless man on the street so that I may take the house of Israel in their own heart because they have deserted me for their idols, all of them. Okay? Therefore, say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, repent and turn from your idols. Now, a lot of the religious leaders today are saying, well, we need to repent, but they never say, stop breaking the Ten Commandments. Never. Okay, we'll examine one in particular, a very famous one here in a little bit. And turn away your faces from all your abominations, for every one of the house of Israel or the stranger that lives in Israel who separates himself from me. Now, that's an interesting statement, isn't it? So everyone needs to ask this. Have I separated myself from God? Hmm? What does that mean? How do you do that? By doing your own thing. All the time. And sets up idols in his heart and puts a stumbling block of his iniquity before his face, comes to the prophet to ask him concerning me, I, the Lord, will answer him myself. See, because they're coming, oh, tell us about the Lord. Yes, and Joel Osteen will stay. Oh, you're such wonderful people. God wants to bless you with this and that. He doesn't say, hey, people, we're here on Sunday. And for all these years, I've been keeping Sunday. So I recently read the Bible. Who? And I found out that it says, remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. So I'm making a big announcement here. This will be our last Sunday service, and next week you come back on the Sabbath. Think that'll ever happen? No, because he's got the idols in his mind, and all the people out there have the idols in their minds, and they love, as it says in Isaiah 30, to be spoken smooth things. 
nice things. See? No, there it is. Notice what will happen. If there's no repentance, verse 8, and I will set my face against that man, and I will make him for a sign and, and a proverb, and I will cut him off from the midst of his people, and you shall know that I am the Lord. Now, notice this. All prophets, now we're going to bring up a very famous one that's currently very active in a little bit. The prophet, if he's deceived and speaks a word, I, the Lord, have deceived that prophet. Now, how does he do that? It happens automatically. Whenever anyone reads anything about the Word of God, and it's something that they should do, or something that they should know, or something that's going to help them draw close to God, and they don't do it, and they reject it, see? then it sets up the idol in their mind that I know more than God. Now, they don't say it that way, but when they reject the commandments of God, is that not what they're doing? And we're going to see that there are going to be a lot of false prophets out there, and they are there. Okay? And I will stretch out my hand upon him, and I will destroy him from the midst of my people. And they shall bear the punishment of their iniquity. The punishment of the prophet shall be even as the punishment of him who seeks unto him, so that the house of Israel may never again go astray from me. Now, this is all leading up to the return of Christ. Because Israel has always left God. So Christ is going to have to come and be here on earth. And that's why we're here. Because we're going to take over the world and rule the world and being priests, peace and truth and righteousness and love and everything that needs to be. So, Netanyahu, he gave the speech and said, they're coming after you. Now, also on that, we'll talk about the temple here in a little bit, because the whole war, as we will see, is so that they can build a temple. All right? Now, good old California, leader in perversion, California schools mandate rooming with transgender students for overnight trips. Huh. Wonder what they're going to do in the sleeping bags. Okay. Now watch this. The UN, the United Nations, will sign the pack of the future in less than 60 days. So that's, we'll find out. In September... The United Nations 79th General Assembly will host the highly anticipated Summit of the Future. What is the Summit of the Future? Read Revelation 13 and Revelation 17. Babylon the Great. Now remember what happened in the days of Daniel and Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar was the head of gold, but Babylon was the whole system through all of those empires, clear down to the end as we covered last week. And so Babylon the Great is going to be enacted again, and it's going to come. And it says here, where nations will sign pact of the future, representing a major step toward the creation of what? a world government. Now, a little sidebar on that. If Donald Trump is elected as president, he will probably get rid of the UN and send it back to Geneva, where the League of Nations was originated, and those buildings are still all intact. And that will help set up the things with Europe. The summit of the future is to take place in New York City on the 22nd and 23rd of September. Okay. And our common agenda, also called 
the summit of the future, to forge a new global consensus and readying ourselves for a future that is rife with risks, but also opportunities. Now, then they say this of the pact of the future. It will be a world, an international system that is better prepared to manage the challenges we now face. Now, all of those words sound so good, but they never, never work. See, the truth is you can't build it from the top down. That's why God starts with the individual and builds up because the individual and conversion and love and truth and obedience and worship of God becomes the important thing, not the dictatorship from the top down. Okay. The UN has also recently announced their plan to have a global digital compact. And the stated purpose of that is to establish an inclusive global framework essential for multi-stakeholders action required to overcome digital data and innovation divides. In other words, bring in the mark of the beast. Okay. All being done right now. Now then, the war between the Jews, Hamas, and Hezbollah and Iran is this. It's going to lead to the building of the third temple. And they have just recently found some tremendous things that they didn't know of. So let's read it. Archaeological dig in Jerusalem finds fortifications believed to be from the time of King David. Archaeologists in the City of David National Park in Jerusalem have discovered massive fortifications that would have protected the city in ancient times. Now, you saw the picture that we had. We had we had up here Fort Antonio, and then the temple area down here. Well, what we're talking about now is that which is missing because there was another big hill higher than the temple, and that's where the city of David was. That's where David's palace was, and Solomon built it, okay? And below that was this great moat, which they have discovered, okay? And it's 30 feet deep and 100 feet wide. Now, all filled in with dirt. How did that happen? Well, during the days, this was in the Maccabees, John Hyrcanus, he took that high hill that used to be the, the city of David, and he had it all scraped down, filled into the moat, cover it over, filled into the Tyronean Valley. So that's why no one knows where the temple actually was. Okay? So, you look for that. All right? Now then, let's come to Matthew 24. Let's look at end time false prophets for today. Now, if you go to YouTube or Facebook there are thousands of different ministers preaching different things. And it's nothing but a bunch of confusion. And we'll cover that a little bit here. But look at what Jesus said. Come here to Matthew 24. Okay. And verse 4. This was at the very start. Okay. Then Jesus answered and said to them, Be on guard. Always be alert. Be watchful. So that no one deceives you. Then it says in another place, By any means. 
Now, remember the principle. If you're deceived, that means you believe sin. And what does the Feast of Unleavened Bread teach us? Little sin leavens the whole lump. And that's exactly what's happened to America. You start getting rid of God from school. You start getting rid of God from the government. And you start getting rid of God from the churches. And that's what has happened. Okay. Verse 5. Many. Now, I want you to think about the word many. And what does that mean in the Bible? Well, let's come clear back to Daniel, the 12th chapter. It says that knowledge shall increase, which it is, and now with AI, and they're spending billions and billions and billions right now on developing it even more. Okay. Be on guard. No one deceives you. Many shall come in my name. Many. Okay. Okay. Many going to and fro, Daniel 12. Look at all of the cars. Look at all the means of transportation. Okay? So when it says many, it means the majority. Because those who really answer the call of God and repent and are baptized and receive the Holy Spirit and live their lives according to God's way are the few. Okay? We'll see that in just a bit. Then he also says, notice this, and they shall deceive many, even saying that he's the Christ. Don't we have that? Yes, indeed. Now, verse 6, we already covered that. You shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. He said, don't be upset for those things take place. Now let's come back here to Matthew 7. Let's see again. He gives the warning. And we will look at it, and we will look at what one popular so-called prophet has to say. Verse 13. Now, isn't it something how that these very scriptures we've covered how many times? Many, many times. But these are the ones that are really important to watch out for. So let's see what Jesus said here, even though we know it. Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And many, again, many, that means the majority, are those who enter through it. For narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way that leads to life, and few are those who find it. Now, isn't that interesting? You go back and you look at all the prophets of old. Every one of them had to stand alone. Think of that. They didn't have a lot of followers. They didn't have many people who believed them. Read about Jeremiah. Take the time. Read the whole book through. And see, the only one that Jeremiah had with him was Baruch, his scribe. That was it. Everyone was against him. He came from the city of Anathoth. And because he spoke things against the city and against the people, the word of God, the destruction that was coming, and they didn't pay any attention to him, the men of his own hometown were rising up to kill him. And they were priests. So when it says few find it, it means it. But beware, be on guard, watch out for Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, for within they are ravening wolves. They're educated, they're good talkers, they're very persuasive, they sound fine, they're, in some cases they're very gentle, and, you know, 
just so nice and wonderful? Really? Hmm? What does it say back in Isaiah, the eighth chapter? It says, to the law and to the testimony. If they speak not according to this word, it's because there's no light in them. See? That's the test. Okay? Now, we've also had that come in the churches of God. Okay? He says, Come to you in sheep's clothing, for within they are ravening wolves. Now, they don't think so. But we've all experienced what happened to the church. You shall know them by their fruits. They do not gather grapes from thorns nor figs from thistles, do they? In the same way, every good tree produces good fruit, and a corrupt tree produces evil fruit. All right? Why? Okay. Because the good tree is always looking for the truth. The truth, the truth, the truth, the truth. Hold your place here and come to John the 8th chapter. Let's see what Jesus said. Now, this is very interesting indeed, because you would think at the temple, at least at the temple, there would be truth and righteousness there would be love and understanding. That's God's headquarters. That's where God put his presence in the Shanika. Verse 31, John 8. Therefore, Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him. Now, think of that. They were the ones that said, oh, he's the Messiah. And just like today. Oh, there's Jesus. Jesus died for our sins. You can do anything you want because you're under grace. Okay? Jews who believed in him. Notice what he said to them. If, there it is, conditional. Every time there's an if, circle it, because that means it's conditional. That means it's your choice. That means you have to choose it. That means you have to do it. If you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Now reverse that. Okay? If you do not continue in my word, truly you are not my disciples. And you will never know the truth, and you will never be free. Okay? Because that's what it's saying. See? Idols in your mind. Thinking evil continually. Okay? Now, some of those things bring pleasure for a while. But remember, everything that is a pleasure is not everything that is good. Because Satan comes and he brings what? A benefit. Always. Okay? Now back to Matthew, the seventh chapter. Verse 19. Every tree that is not producing good fruit is cut down and cast into the fire. You can line that up with John, the 15th chapter as well. Therefore, you shall assuredly know them by their fruits. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, see? And isn't that what they say? All you have to do is say, Jesus, come into my life. Oh, they do mention repentance every once in a while, but they never tell you to keep the commandments of God, okay? Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who is doing the will of my Father who is in heaven. Now, is not the Father the righteous one of the whole universe? And Christ, the Word, right there with him? And what did he say of himself? He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. See? All of that. 
Now, this is important to do for us to understand because we're going to see, and we'll probably take it after the break so we can get into it in detail, that these false prophets are very good speakers, very persuasive, and make plausible arguments. But they don't stick to the truth. Let's go on. Many will say to me in that day, that's a judgment day. Did we not prophesy through your name? Did we not cast out demons through your name? Now, that's a pretty mighty work, isn't it? Casting out demons? What does it say of the false prophet back there in Revelation 13? He calls fire down from heaven. Whoa, that must be from God. Remember, you can read in the Old Testament, did Elijah call fire down from heaven? Okay. Now, when you see it, you believe it. So that's why Jesus said, beware of false prophets. And did we not perform many works of power through your name? We built buildings, we had hospitals, we did all of these things, we had universities, we even helped out in the government and all of that, okay? Now notice, then I will confess to them, I never knew you, depart from me, you who work lawlessness. Oh, that's the key. Lawlessness means this, against law. Now they might say it, Very comfortably. I've got an article right here. Okay. Saving this for another message. Why don't Catholics worship on the Sabbath? And they got plausible arguments. See? And you can download this. You can just look for it. Okay. Well, Jesus, after the resurrection, met the disciples on the first day of the week. Did he really? He walked with two of them to Emmaus. Mary Magdalene saw him, that's true. Was that a Sunday worship service? And when did Jesus come to the disciples? He, they came, he came to them after, the, after Sunday had ended. Okay. Because when he went with the two to Emmaus, he left because it was getting late and just poof, disappeared. They didn't know what happened to them. So then they, dis, they realized it was Jesus. They ran back and the other apostles were there and they began telling him that they had seen Jesus and they didn't believe him, and then all of a sudden, boom, Jesus appears right in the middle. Okay. What time of day was that then? Was that on the first day of the week or the second day of the week? And then he taught them out of the scriptures and opened their minds to understand about him. And where? The law, the prophets, and the psalm. Right? So how long did this go on into the night? On the second day of the week, right? Why doesn't the Catholic Church keep it on Monday? See, because they're false. All right, let's come back here. Now notice, here's the key thing. Here's the whole summary of everything that Jesus was saying in this chapter, verse 24. Therefore, or you might say in conclusion, everyone who hears these words of mine and practices them, that's the Greek word poieo, meaning to practice. Now, the King James says, do it. But that doesn't have the full impact of what it really means in the Greek. Practices them, which means what? If you practice it, that's how you live. 
Okay. When we keep the Sabbath, do we keep the Sabbath one time and then the rest of the year we don't do anything and come back and keep the Sabbath again a year later? No, we do it every seventh day, just like the commandment says. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. See? Now, others read that when he says, because the seventh day he rested after creating. So then they reason this way. They come to that and they say, well, that means one day in seven. Doesn't say that. Says, remember the seventh day. See? To keep it holy. Now that becomes important when we get to this false prophet I'm going to come to after the break. Okay? Practices them. So that means you do it all the time. You keep the commandments of God. You love God. Go ahead and put in your notes John 14. How many times did he said, if you love me, if you love me, if you love me. See, the whole world wants the love of God coming to them, but they don't want to give the love back to God that's necessary. And what is the love of God that we are to have? To love God how? With all our heart, with all our mind, with all our soul. Huh? Isn't that what it says? Practices them. I will compare him to a wise man who built his house upon the rock. And who is the rock? Jesus Christ is the rock. And the rock that the builders rejected. See? And the rain came down. That's the whole experience of life. And the floods came. Your difficult trials and problems that come. And the winds blew and beat upon the house. Sometimes we have trials that seem like they never end, like waves coming in, boom, boom, boom. Okay. But it did not fall. In other words, you kept the love and commandments of God, and you did not succumb to all of the pressures coming against you to give up on God. So we need to ask the question in our experience. There were a lot of people who attended church, and when the waves came and the floods came and the difficulties came, they left. Where are they? Because they never understood about the prophets. The prophets had to stand alone against everyone. So sometimes that's the way it is with us. And sometimes that's the way it is with the decisions we have to make. See? Founded on the rock, verse 26. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not practice them shall be compared to a foolish man who built his house upon the sand. And you know how that goes. See? Every time there's a flood, the houses wash away. And every time I see that in the news, when they have these big rainstorms and those people build their houses right up at the edge of the river, river bank, and it's there year after year after year and nothing happens, and then all of a sudden they have a lot of rain and the floods come touring, uh, just swooping down full blast in the river. We have a river like that here in Hollister. It's dry most of the year. And most years, with a little bit of rain, we get a little trickle of water in the river. And then when we have a lot, a lot of rain, like we've had here this past couple of years, it's a river just coming full blast, full torrent of it, okay? The rain came, the floods came, the wind blew, beat upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. Okay, And that's what happens with false prophets, false teaching. Well, let's go ahead and take a break, and we'll come back, and we will look at one of the very popular, wonderful so-called prophets 
in America today. Let's continue on with Sabbath services before we get on with the false prophet in our time. Need to make one correction, which I didn't catch on the news, which is this, that Kamala Harris did meet with Netanyahu for a short period of time, and then they had, I believe, a photo op after that, and nothing was said of it. And after that, I believe that Netanyahu went down to Florida and and spent a good deal of time with Donald Trump. Now, who is this false prophet that I'm talking about? He's well known. Everyone has seen him. Many people have heard him. And his name is Jonathan Kahn. And he's written a lot of books. And I've read a lot of his books. He's done a lot of YouTube presentations. There's a lot of them on there. And he has one in particular that that someone sent to me, so I watched it, and that was the attempted assassination of Donald Trump compared to anointing of the high priest by Moses. Now, how did he get there? And what comparison did that have? Now, it's very similar. His reasoning is very similar to what he did when Roe v. Wade was voted as unlawful for the federal government to have abortion policy, but it should go to all of the states. He said this was a wonderful thing, a great victory of God, and down to the very second. Well, he forgot to tell you that now, instead of one battle with one Supreme Court, you've got 50 battles, in every, one in every state. And abortion has only went down a little bit, but now it's coming back. And now they have a very popular item, self-abortion. So think on that. Now, what does that get down to? That gets down to the thought of the woman who's pregnant, correct? Yes. Now, a lot of women like to blame men that they have to have abortions. And I'm sure some men have forced women to have it. But the woman is the one who makes the final choice when she's pregnant. So we have, instead of outlawing abortion, we now have 50 different laws concerning abortion. So what Jonathan Kahn said was a great victory was just to spread it around and increase it even more. Now, this latest one is really quite an outrageous stretch of the imagination, but he's very persuasive in how he presents it. And he says this, Donald Trump was wounded on his right ear and the blood was there. And then later, he stuck up his fist with the blood on it and said, fight, fight, fight. And then as they were protecting him, he got down on his knees as if to pray. And he also asked for his shoe because he lost his shoe. It slipped off his foot. So then he proceeds to say, "From now you go to Leviticus 8. Let's go there. Leviticus 8, and let's see how he can give a good spin, a fast talk, convincing, and there will be people believing it and say, oh, isn't that interesting? See? That's why you have to come back. Is it the truth of God, the way the truth should be spoken? Is it properly applied in any way? 
So let's read it. This has to do with the uh, sacrificial anointing of Aaron and his sons. Okay? They were to take a sacrificial lamb, and let's begin in verse 23, Leviticus 8. This is what he referred to. And somehow, this was an anointing from God for Donald Trump. Well, Donald Trump understood it was by the grace of Almighty God that he was spared. But did he become a high priest? No. Let's read it. And he killed it, that is, Moses sacrificed the the ram, and Moses took of the blood of it and put it on the tip of Aaron's right ear. Now, that's where the wound was, right, on Donald Trump, and there was blood on his right ear. Do you see any significance to that? No. And on the thumb of his right hand, because he had blood on his right hand. And on the big toe of his right foot, because he lost his shoe. So he says, that this was a special anointing from God. Well, it doesn't compare at all, because first of all, Donald Trump's blood is not the blood of a ram. And the bullet is not the hand of Moses putting it on his ear. And the blood on his right hand was not just on his thumb, it was also on the side, the right side of his face and on his right hand. No comparison at all. So this is how false prophets come along and get something. Now, Donald Trump was not anointed into any high priest office because of that. Has nothing to do with it. Did that happen at the tabernacle? No, that happened in Butler, Pennsylvania, right? Okay. Now, verse 24, he didn't explain this either. And he brought Aaron's sons, and Moses put the blood on the tip of their right ear, on the thumb of their right hands, and on the great toes of their right foot. And Moses sprinkled the blood against the side of the altar all around. No comparison at all. So people hear someone like Jonathan Kahn bring that up, and they think, oh, he's got such a wonderful understanding. The truth is, He doesn't owe anything about the New Testament other other than the name of Yahshua. Now, he is a Jewish rabbi, and he always dresses like a Jewish rabbi. Black yarmulke, black tie, black shirt, black coat, because that's the way rabbis do. Now, if you don't believe me, then you just go on YouTube and you look up Jonathan Kahn and the Passover. And you will see that that he has the Jewish Seder on the 15th. He never says anything about the 14th. Never makes the connection the way it should be if he makes any connection at all on Christ dying on the 14th. Okay. And when he goes before his Protestants, which he does, he had Friday night temple for the Jews. And then he goes to Sunday services for the Protestants. And he tells them it's all right to eat unclean foods and you can keep Sunday because the Sabbath is for the Jews. False prophet. But he's so slick and so smooth and fast-talking that people think, oh, this is a wonderful thing indeed. See, So this in Leviticus 8 
has nothing to do with the attempted assassination of Donald Trump. Yes, an angel probably quickly moved his head, so he wasn't shot. And yes, he's there by the grace of Almighty God, the one who became Jesus Christ. So this shows you how people can be led astray and thinking that this is so biblical when he never even turned to the scriptures. Now then, let's talk about the blood of Christ that was all shed at the cross. And the spear thrust into his side and pierced his heart. That was done so that every drop of blood from Christ would be offered right there. Now let's look at some other false prophets in the New Testament and how it's so easy to get taken in. Let's come to Acts the 8th chapter and let's see what happened here. This is quite a thing indeed when you look at it and analyze it and think what happened. And it also was a close encounter with Stephen, who had just ordained a short time before as a deacon. So let's begin right here in verse 1. And a great persecution arose against the church that was in Jerusalem, and all the believers were scattered throughout the countries of Judea, Samaria, except the apostles. And later we found out a few chapters later that it got clear up to Antioch, okay? Now notice, but Saul was ravaging the church, going from house to house, entering in and dragging out men and women and delivering them up to the prison. Okay? Tough time, right? Therefore, those who were scattered passed through everywhere, preaching the word of the gospel. And Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed Christ to them. Now, notice what happened here. And the multitudes listened intently with one accord to the things that were spoken by Philip when they heard and saw the signs that he did. So here's what he did. Verse 7, the unclean spirits came out crying with a loud voice. Well, didn't we read back there in Matthew, the seventh chapter, that even the false ministers that come along are able to cast out demons? Yes, we did. Okay, so this was something that he was doing here. Came out of many of those who had had them, and many who were paralyzed and lame were healed. And there was great joy in the city. Now notice, Satan is Johnny on the spot. Never misses an opportunity. Verse 9. And there was a certain man named Simon. Now this is the one, well just a little sidebar here, who became the Peter who went to Rome in 42 AD. The apostle Peter never went there. You go to church at home and look up all the segments that I did on Peter never went to Rome. I think you'll find that most enlightening. Okay? Name Simon who from earlier times had been practicing sorcery in the city and astounding the nation of Samaria, proclaiming himself to be some great one. And to him, all the people flocked. He's the great one. And to him, they had all given heed from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the great power of God. 
Now, what are they going to say of the false prophet in Revelation 13 when that comes along? That this man is a great power of God. Okay. Now, they were giving heed to him because he had for a long time bewitched them with sorceries. Hmm. What does it say of Babylon the Great? Sorceries. Witchcraft. Okay. Here, hold your place and let's come to Revelation 17. Let's just read it. And this is right at the end time. Okay. Verse 1. One of the seven angels who had the seven vials came and spoke with me, saying to me, Come here, I will show you the judgment of the great whore who sits upon many waters. And the waters are peoples and multitudes, nations, and so forth. And the waters are the sea of Revelation 13. With whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and those who dwell on the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. And he carried me away in his spirit to the wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting upon a scarlet beast that had seven heads and ten horns full of the names of blasphemy. And the woman was clothed with purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and pearls and precious stones and had a golden cup in her hand filled with the abominations of the filthiness of her fornication. And across her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of the harlots and the abominations of the earth. Okay. Now, Samaria was where, when the ten tribes were taken out, the Assyrians brought in people from Babylon to live there. So they had the Babylonian mystery system there. Okay. All right, so there it is. Let's come back here to Acts, the 8th chapter. Let's see what happened. Now, have we had people come into the church in our time that looked great, that sounded great, that preached great, that sounded like that they were authoritative? Yes, we did. What happened? Well, their colors finally came out a little later on. Okay. Now, verse 11 says, deceived to bewitch them with their sorceries. Verse 12. But when they believed Philip, who was preaching the gospel, the things concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. And Simon himself also believed. Now, that's not belief under conversion. That is belief to profit oneself. So this is why it's very important in baptizing that it be a good baptism. Believed, and after being baptized, so Philip made a mistake. See? He should have done as Peter did a little later, we'll see. But he didn't do it. He steadfastly continued with Philip as he beheld the signs and great works of powers that were being done. He was amazed. And when the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria received the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them. Okay? Because they knew this couldn't be good. Now you stop and think. You go back. You go back to the time in John, the fourth chapter, when Jesus came to the well and the woman of Samaria came out there. And he said, well, you know, you have had five men, and none of them are your husband. And she went back, and she told him, this man told me all about my life. Come out there. So they come out there, and Jesus stayed there and preached. So they had some exposure to the truth. See? But Simon Magus, meaning magician, he didn't confront Jesus at that time. Verse 15, 
And Peter and John, who after coming down to Samaria, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. So God held back giving the Holy Spirit to those who were baptized because of the deceitfulness of of Simon Magus. Okay? For as yet it had not fallen upon them, but they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid their hands on them and prayed, and they received the Holy Spirit. Now notice, Satan is always there. So Simon was there. See, Now he didn't think he was doing anything evil or wrong because he thought that what he was doing was right, and he's going to incorporate all of these new things and what he was doing as well. Okay? Verse 18. Now, when Simon saw that the Holy Spirit was given by the laying on of hands of the apostles, he offered them money. Merchandising the people. Saying, give this authority to me also. So that on whomever I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Spirit. See? Now, look at what Peter said to him. See, And this shows exactly what happens when you have a false prophet. Coming in, professing belief, not really being part of it, but want to become part of it to take for himself and go on his own. Okay? But Peter said to him, May your money be destroyed with you because you thought that the gift of God might be purchased with money. You have neither part nor lot in this matter, for your heart is not right before God. That's the key thing. Everything we have touched today depends on what? What? is your thought. What are the motivations of what you do inwardly that no one knows anything about? See? But God does. What did Jesus say? Here, hold your place right here. We'll come back. Come to Mark, the fourth chapter, okay? Mark 4. This is for sure. And this is why these things come about. Mark 4. And verse 22, very important verse, see, because what would have happened in the church if they would have gone along with Simon Magus and say, oh, what a wonderful thing. Just think, this man who used to be using witchcraft and sorcery against the people, oh, he's repented, and he's one of us now. No. No doesn't work that way, okay? He had these hidden motives, what he wanted to do. Verse 22, Mark 4. But there is nothing hidden that shall not be made manifest, okay? Nor has any secret thing taken place that shall not come to light. See? Whatever the attitudes of people that have, sooner or later they come out. Okay? There it is right there. Now, what are we seeing right now happen within the Democrat Party? Exactly what verse 22 is talking about. All of their secret agendas and what they're going to do. Okay? So let's come back here to Acts, the 8th chapter. So here's what he said. Now, this is very instructive in itself. Repent, therefore, of this your wickedness, and beseech God, if perhaps the thoughts of your heart may be forgiven you. And Simon fell down at his knees, he grabbed the skirt of the, of the apostles, wept in great repentance, and everything was fine. No, it wasn't. But Simon answered and said, 
you. Here's a great lesson. No one else can repent for anybody else. Repentance is directly of the individual, directly to God, through Christ. And it has to be true, and it has to be of the heart, and it has to be getting rid of all of the idols in the mind and in the heart, and all of the self-willedness and great things that have been done by that individual, or all of the evil things and rotten things that have been done. See? Okay. I be you beseech the Lord on my behalf, so that none of these things that you have spoken may come upon me. Well, they didn't do it. Okay. Let's look at another account back here, Acts 13. See? Now, this is on the very first evangelistic tour of Paul and Barnabas. Acts 13, and this is in ver verse 6. Okay? Now, no, let's go back to verse 5. Because Paul and Barnabas went out then on an evangelistic tour to preach the gospel and to establish churches. And they always went into the synagogue of the Jews first. And every time Paul came into the synagogue of the Jews, sometimes it ended up being a riot. Okay. Verse 5. So they came to Salamis. They preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews, and they also had John as an assistant. And when they had gone through the island as far as, as Paphos, they found a certain sorceress, a false prophet, a Jew named Bar-Jesus, the son of Jesus. Well, how about that? He had been with proconsul Sergius Paulus, an intelligent man who called Barnabas and Paul to him, desiring to hear the word of God. So here's an encounter. But Eliamus the sorcerer, same as Simon, right? The sorcerer. For so his name was interpreted, withstood them, seeking to turn away the proconsul from the faith. But Paul, who is also called Saul, rather, who is also called Paul, so that's the first time he's called Paul, and it's Paul all the way after that, being filled with the Holy Spirit, fixed his eyes on him. Now, this doesn't this sound pretty much like what Peter and John did to Simon Magus back there in Acts the 8th chapter? Yes, indeed. And said, O full of guile and all craftiness, you son of the devil, an enemy of all righteousness, will you not cease to pervert the straight ways of the Lord? So what was he doing? He was taking the scriptures of the Old Testament and perverting them. Now, how much about Christ that he knew? We don't know. It isn't said here. But every time a false prophet comes along, they pervert the word of God. Boom. They always do, because they have an agenda. Now, sometimes you never know what that agenda is going to be for a long time. See? Yes, yeah, son of the devil, all righteousness, will you not cease to pervert the straight ways of the Lord? And now, behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you shall be blind, not seeing for a season. And immediately a mist and darkness fell upon him, and he went away seeking someone to lead him by the hand. Okay? Then after this, Sergius Paulius thought that, and he said, Woohoo! Imagine what he was. Now, it didn't say that he was baptized or any of that, but it's very likely that it was. Okay? Now then. Let's come to 1 John, the second chapter. 
Now, notice what he says here, because there has always been this constant fight and antagonism against the mysteries of Babylon and the true church of God. Always. And they like to try and get in and subvert it to take it down. And we have seen how they do that. And it was done over a long period of time. But it finally happened. Okay? Now notice what John says here. Verse 18. Little children, it is the last time. Now, that was true to the extent that it was the last time of the apostles, and John was the only living apostle at this time. Okay? So you read Second John and Third John, how they treated him. They actually, Demetrius kicked him out of the congregation. All right? The last time, and just as you have heard, the Antichrist is coming. Okay? Now, that's what we're talking about in Revelation 13. The Antichrist, the beast, and the false prophet. Okay? Even now, many Antichrists have risen up. Many. Think of the battle that they were fighting. False doctrines, false teaching. How did Sunday keeping come in so quickly after the death of John? How quickly did it come in that the Passover was replaced with Easter? How quickly did it come with the holidays instead of the holy days? See? That's all recorded in the history. Many antichrists have risen up by which we know that it is the last time. They went out from among us. So at first, they leave. Later, they stayed, and they kicked out the true Christian. Okay? They went out from among us, but they were not of us, because if they were of us, they would have remained with us. Nevertheless, they left, so that it might be exposed to show that they all were not of us. Okay. Now, then he says something very important about the use of the Holy Spirit that God has given to us and what how we need to exercise that. And that's why there's prayer. That's why there's study. That's why there's growing and overcoming in the Spirit of God. Now, today we're faced with, you think they had many antichrists back then? Wow, the world full of them. All you have to do is go on YouTube and there's false prophet after false prophet after false prophet preaching many different things. One man even says that, there's, that the sixth trumpet has sounded because the river Euphrates is way low. Not so. Okay. So the truth is this. If they don't keep the Sabbath and keep the holy days and know what the holy days mean in prophecy, they don't know the prophecies at the end time the way that they should. Now, they preach there's coming an Antichrist. Okay? There's even one man who's a Jew who says that King Charles is the Antichrist. Well, He's about as dynamic as a wet washcloth. He couldn't inspire anyone to follow him and worship him. Okay? And yet, this man, he has some prophecies that look pretty good. Okay? But you see, because they look good or plausible, or there is a parallelism that looks like it might work like with Jonathan Kahn and the blood on the ear and the hand and the foot doesn't necessarily mean that it's true. That's why it's to the law and the testimony, to the word of God, to the truth of God, to the love of God, that we are able to stand in spite of all of these false prophets. 
Verse 20, you have the anointing from the Holy One, and you have knowledge of all things pertaining to salvation. Now, it couldn't mean you have knowledge of all things that there is in the world. Obviously, that's not true. That's why we, we put in italics pertaining to salvation. I did not write to you because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and you understand that not one lie comes from the truth. Now, you can make it appear to lie if you read it wrongly, if you interpret it wrongly, or if you don't know what you're talking about. Who is not the liar if it is not the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ? And even the Pope said here recently, Jesus failed. Now, he's supposed to be blasphemously called the Holy Father. That can never be. That can never be. And how can you have a church organization that has priests who are supposed to be celibate, but they're called fathers? That's a tough one to figure. And that, they're pedophiles. And how about nuns who are married to the church? And if they're married to the church, and the priest is a father, and they have relations to bring forth children to put in their orphanages, you see how it works? Okay. Now it says, he is the Antichrist, the one who denies the Father and the Son. How do you deny it? Okay. Well, you add in a third person and make a trinity. See? You're denying the Father and the Son when you do that. Anyone who denies the Son does not have the Father either. Therefore, let what you have heard from the beginning dwell in you. If what you have heard from the beginning is dwelling in you, then you will be dwelling in the Son and the Father. This is the promise that he promised us eternal life. Okay? So there's the fight going on right there. Now come over here to chapter 4. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirit. Now, because why? Whether they are from God or not, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Again, many false prophets, many antichrists. What goes with them? Demonic spirits. See? That's how they sound so persuasive. That's how they do the works that they do. By this test, you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus has come in the flesh is from God. And they deny that by saying that Christ, the Spirit being, possessed a man called Jesus. So when the man died, Christ really didn't die. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus had come in the flesh is not of God. This is the spirit of Antichrist, which was to come and even now is in the world. Okay. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them because greater is he who's in you than who's in the world. Okay. Then we have another, another sign that comes along with these false prophets and these antichrists, see? People will listen to those like Jonathan Kahn, Billy Graham, Joel Olstein, and the whole host of them that are on TBN and, and Daystar. And all of them have been subverted, subverted so that they have another Jesus, they have another salvation, they have another gospel, 
They don't believe in the truth of God the way that it should be. And if they believe in part of the truth, are they ever going to come to Sunday rejection and keeping the Sabbath? Are they ever going to reject the holidays of this world? No. That's why Jesus said, you will know them by their fruits. What do they produce? See, there it is. Now, 1 John 5. Let's pick it up here in verse 17. Okay. All unrighteousness is sin. All the commandments of God are righteousness. Hate is righteousness. That's against God. And there is a sin not unto death. Because we have to overcome, we do sin. We know that anyone who is begotten by God does not practice sin. You don't live in it. You sin, but you repent of it. You don't live in it. See, that's the key. Sunday keepers live in their sin. For the one who has been begotten by God keeps himself by the power of God, and the wicked one does not touch him. See? He can't get a hold of you. See, because wherever these false prophets are, come what? Demons. Lying spirits. Okay? Verse 19. We know. Now, this is what we need to know in this day and age. We know that we are of God and that the whole world lies in the power of the wicked one. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us an understanding so that we may know him who is true, and we are in him who is true, and in his Son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. And he says up here in verse 19, that the whole world lies in the power of the wicked one. So, the false prophets for today can come and sound very clever, very smooth, very intelligent, and present things as if they are true. Now, before we close, I might mention that I got a call from Mary Fanny in, who is on the Ark to Midnight program, and she asked me to be on their program tonight, 7.30 Pacific time. So I don't know how long I'll be on, but that is very interesting indeed. She talked with those who, who have the, uh, arc, the uh, caravan to midnight, and I found out caravan to midnight operates five days, and then arc to midnight is over the Saturday and Sunday. So we'll see how that goes and what happens there. So appreciate your prayers concerning that.